announce agreements with 18 countries, including six in Africa, that they would now trade using their own currencies instead of the dollar. The U.S. currency became the top reserve currency after World War II, but that was almost 80 years ago, and for many countries, that model no longer fits. So are India's new trade agreements an isolated event, or one more manifestation of a movement away from the dollar? Hello, I'm Carol Pino. Welcome to our show, Africa USA Now, current events at the intersection of Africa and the United States. Our program is presented by the World Trade Center, Washington, D.C., and supported by the African Development Bank and the Africa Investment Forum. The U.S. dollar has been the main reserve currency since the end of World War II, when the international monetary system was set up at the Bretton Woods Conference. Following the war, the world was in shambles. But at the time, the U.S. manufactured over one-half of all goods produced, and one-third of all global exports were products made in America. But all that has changed with the emergence of China and so much manufacturing moving to the global south. Supply chains are longer and often span the globe. Ford is still an American car company, Mercedes German and Toyota Japanese, but parts for those cars are made and assembled all over the world. In 2000, a dozen or so African countries traded more with China than the U.S. Today, almost all of them do. In 2000, the U.S. was the top trading partner for 80% of the world. Today, it's less than 30%. In a world where trade patterns have changed so drastically, does it still make sense to keep the dollar as the currency of trade? It's a complex topic with a lot of implications, and we have an extraordinary group of guests to unpack it all. Ippolite Bofak, Chief Economist at African Bank, the Africa Export-Import Bank, John Simon, Founding Partner at Total Impact Capital and former U.S. Ambassador to the African Union, and Ajit Ranadev, Vice Chancellor of the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Ashid, can you explain to us this new agreement that India has with these 18 countries? Well, this is an arrangement where the mutual trade, between, bilateral trade between countries, is settled in the mutual currencies. The agreement is very recent. Basically, uh, this is an attempt to do settlement and clearing by bypassing the dollar clearing in New York. It's become visible now because uh, it's in the sort of context of what's happening geopolitically over the world. But these kind of arrangements India has had with other countries for several decades, in fact. The oldest arrangement, I believe, was with the Soviet, the then Soviet Union and then Russia. It was called the rupee-ruble trade. Uh, India also did something similar with Iran when Iran was under sanctions and with Sri Lanka recently, with Bangladesh. So in a way, it is not something which is unprecedented for India, but the fact that now at one go, this agreement is with 18 countries makes it significant. And this, of course, can be interpreted as if uh, there is some attempt to uh, diversify away from uh, uh, dollar clearing. I must just add quickly that but 85 to 90% of invoicing, invoicing used to happen in dollar terms. So for goods produced in India or produced somewhere else, but the invoicing used to be in dollars. Also, recently, the Central Bank of India, the Reserve Bank, also encouraged invoicing in local currencies. So there's a there's a lot of going, lots going on. You might say this is also an attempt to internationalize the uh, rupee, the, the Indian currency. Why was the agreement only with six African countries? I would think every African country would want to be part of that. No, I don't think it's a group agreement. I mean, there are 54 countries in Africa, and uh, India has diplomatic relations with all of them. But I think uh, this agreement has to build on a lot of nitty gritties. So I think it has to be a country at a time. So Hippolyte, what would be the advantage for African countries? For many years, the U.S. was actually Africa's single largest trading partner. And then China took over. And then in 2018, India became number two after China. So as you can see, there is a lot of dynamic going on. And so what India is doing in terms of uh, building on that deepening trade tie between India and Africa will actually help a lot in boosting overall trade between the two countries. And moving away from the vehicle currency will help a lot in that direction. The African continent, it's actually one of the most vulnerable to global volatility and linked to the fact that 
most of the trade is actually in US dollar. But when we had the Fed hiking interest rate last year, 2022, at aggressive pace, we had massive capital outflow from Egypt, $20 billion in the first part semester. And as a result, the Egyptian pound has actually almost collapsed, more than 50% depreciations. So that exposure to US dollars, the reserve currency, has been quite significant. So it constraints it has constraint in the financing side, financial market. It has constraint in the trade space because simply not enough of it. Now you wonder how come many African countries, including Egypt, often go back to the IMF to get the dollars, while the US or Europeans with run deficit all the time. In fact, I don't know, multiple of African deficits, tens of multiple. You don't have to go back to the IMF or to the World Bank for that matter. It explains that difference and the privilege of having that reserve currency. I think the benefit of what is happening is that by using local currency, we essentially reduce the foreign currency content of trade. If you look at Indonesia, for instance, they say that in 2021, they were able to save easily $2.5 billion by moving to a local currency. So there is a trend toward reducing that exposure to U.S. monetary policy. When the increase in interest rate, you have massive capital outflows. There's also an attempt to essentially use local currency to reduce that vulnerability to hard currency, which we need to stabilize your own currency. So, John, how do you think that the U.S. is reacting to this? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Having a, a reserve currency gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility um, in terms of our own economic policy, and it does so at the expense of many other countries, imposing on other countries challenges that, that, that we don't have to face. It also allows us, like I say, to do things from an economic perspective we probably shouldn't be doing, like piling up a massive amount of debt because we can issue our debt in U.S. dollars, and that allows us to avoid those reckonings that other countries have to do. So I think that inflicts significant challenges on, on other countries, and this recent run up in interest rates on, that the, the Fed had, creating a depreciation across the globe, I, I think, of the you know 40 or so African currencies, uh, uh, 35 of them suffered significant depreciation in the last year. And that's that's obviously something that is outside their control. It's, 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 it's a function of what uh, is happening here in Washington, not a function of their own monetary policy. That being said, um, the, the big question, if you're going to move away from the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, is what's the alternative? You know, if, if you're distributing your products throughout Africa, you need to have one currency that you can sell your product in to avoid tr mismatches between all the different currencies. That's part of the reason, for instance, oil, which is exported all across the world, is priced in dollars. And the other important point about the reserve currency is the reserve currency has to be a currency that people have confidence in, in terms of its, of its uh, um, management. Uh, and that's one thing, maybe, maybe unjustified, that the world does have, is they do feel that the dollar is a well-managed currency, and therefore that, that among the, the options that are out there for reserve currencies, people are willing to do their trade in dollars because they believe the value of the dollar is going to be going to hold up over time. This has a geopolitical element to it. It's not purely economics or finance. Countries don't want to be exposed to the volatility of the dollar. It's not just one thing that the commodity prices went up or down. But sometimes, despite no change in the competitiveness of a country, suddenly your, your foreign debt in dollars is going up steeply simply because the dollar has moved in a very volatile fashion, which has nothing to do with, with underlying economic or competitiveness reasons. It's because of geopolitics or it's because of, especially because of monetary policy in the United States. So you are indirectly affected by the fact that the rates are getting tightened in the U.S. and you're an unwitting victim. Some extreme views are saying that sanctions is like weaponizing the dollar using the dollar as a geopolitical tool. So because of that, now countries want to kind of hedge themselves, and therefore that's another reason why the, the, the attempt to go away in, for trading, for invoicing, and for reserve currencies diversifying away from the dollar. Ajit makes reference to another big benefit to the United States and potential cost to other countries, is that when countries trade in the dollars, that means they have to go through the U.S. financial system, by and large, not always, which means they're subject to U.S. sanctions. And so by having the reserve currency in the world not only gives us tremendous economic power, it also gives us tremendous geopolitical power in the sense that 
we can we can sanction countries, even countries that don't trade with us very much at all. Still, to the extent they're trading uh, in something like oil, which is sent on in U.S. dollars, we can impact uh, have significant impact on 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 their trade. And again, that's a that's a value we have that if we were to lose the power of the reserve currency, uh, we would we would no longer. In fact, it's not just geopolitics. By going through your financing, they can actually know exactly how you are deploying your resources and um, what development and growth strategy you have by reaching at what is said in the U.S., follow the money, and then you know the rest. It's actually very important from the standpoint of uh, geopolitics, but also insider and intelligence. Looking for alternatives to the dollar isn't entirely new. Five years ago, a number of Africa's central banks met to discuss changing their reserve currencies from the dollar to the Chinese run. Well, let's move beyond Africa to China and Brazil, which just struck a deal that they would now trade in their own currencies. And then there's the recent meeting of finance ministers from the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, where top of the agenda was moving away from the U.S. dollar and the euro, yen, and British pound. Hippolyte, African Bank recently set up the a payment plan, PAPS, that would allow Africa internally to trade between different currencies. Can you tell us about that? The trade financing gap within the continent has been averaged around $110 billion annually. So we're essentially trading in the currency that we do not have. And I always wonder, why do we need the US dollar, the euro for a trade between Nigeria and Ghana? And I think the African Consent of Free Trade Area Agreement, which bring together the continental under one trading umbrella and provided the opportunity to say, how do we make sure that under the AFCFTA, we reduce that constraint, which is reliance on dollar or euro financing of intra-African trade. And um, so we established the Pan-African Payment Settlement Systems. And the whole idea is, going forward, we use local currency, African currency, in intra-African trade. And that will allow us to reduce foreign exchange exposure to foreign exchange risk, to reduce exposure to the fact that there is issue liquidity. In fact, one of the key constraints challenge facing Africa has been liquidity. And you see country going into a default, not because they are really overburdened with debt, but because liquidity and the refinancing window is just not there, unlike other region. If you map in the rating agency issues, which really widen the spread. So I think the benefit of having PAPS is that we reduce instantaneously the foreign currency content of African trade. Our estimate is that we may be able to save at least $5 billion every year, which is quite significant. And of course, the another benefit is it may actually increase and drive the growth of intra-African trade. John, you were at the African Union, and there's been talk about an African currency for years. What did you see there? The idea of an African currency union has been something that the EU has had on its agenda for years and years. When I was the U.S. ambassador to the EU, that was that was on the agenda then. It's been it's really challenging. It shouldn't be downplayed how difficult it would be to create an African currency union. You need to have fiscal integration. You need to have. Uh, uh, um, labor mobility, you need to have capital mobility, all sorts of things that still need to happen in Africa. But one way for Africa to deal with its reliance on having to do business and, and, and issue debt in U.S. currency would be an African currency union where it could trade among itself and in the international world and issue debt with an African currency. So I think there are two things that have to happen to really push these forward. One is you have to create the space for, for, for uh, and the attention for these issues to really get to the top of the agenda and not be crowded out by, um, uh, like I say, the sort, sort of more urgent issues. Uh, and then secondly, you have to have African countries, African governments committed to the types of reforms that are necessary from a fiscal economic point of view that will allow them to take advantage and, and to join in uh, a, a, a more integrated ec economy across the continent. See, when you look at these developments, do you think that having an African currency, um, that the AFCFTA is making it easier for India to be trading with Africa? Well, absolutely. Africa has been a focus area from the point of view of not just India's trade, 
but also uh, I would say uh, diplomatically, you know, there's been a, a quite an a, you know determined effort to increase uh, Africa India linkages over the last decade. But I think the emergence of a common African currency union, uh, I think it's not going to be as easy. So I think while we wait for that, there are many on many other dimensions. There's uh, significant progress. Uh, there is now, for example, the Export Import Bank of India. It is giving lines of credit uh, to exporters, uh, so it's essentially financing funding uh, African buyers who buy uh, Indian goods and services. And then there are uh, there is also funding or financing of investments uh, into Africa. So there's tremendous you know opportunities. But I don't think the currency union itself is a is a is a big obstacle. It'll help, of course. It'll help. Hippolyte. So when you see the AFCFTA and all that they were able to do, I mean, you know, all these countries coming together, does it give you hope that there there could be an African currency? I used to think that having the euro would be the most difficulty, given the extent which the Dutch mark was part of the German history, the French flag was part of the, the French history, but they were able to transcend that uh, historical route to move toward a single currency. And uh, at a time when the law was pushing that agenda, and they were actually a bit on ease on what one of the ministers called the US exorbitant privilege. And that uh, it was for them to challenge that. So I think necessity enabled uh, them to actually transcend the historical differences and commitment to identity, which is the currency, to follow that Euro agenda. Africa has less commitment to the colonial currency that in, they inherited. But frankly, if anything, most Africans are saying that the CFA franc should be disbanded immediately. And I think if there is a, a commitment, at some point necessity will make it much easier for Africa to move quite rapidly. And that necessity reflects the fact that, really, we are the point where if there's one thing that we need, the world is moving to a greater block, important blocks. So it's important for Africa to actually move at unison and accelerate progress toward integrations and so that they could actually have much stronger bargaining. But John and Maple, I one small point regarding the European Union. It's a union of 28 countries or 27 in the currency union. But four of those countries account for 50% of the GDP. And the euro, the success of the euro has been largely because of a very large implicit and explicit subsidy from the Germans. We don't have such a large, big country which is willing to subsidize 50, 53 other countries in the African Union. But I think it'll happen. In, as as people have said, the benefits, you know, the necessity will will drive. It happens de facto. In fact, once you have free trade agreements, once you have invoicing, once you have, let's not forget digital currencies, cross border India and Singapore are already already uh, you know uh, dealing with digital currencies. So it's, and then there's going to be central bank uh, issued digital currencies. So many new developments are happening even as we speak. I, I would point out that you know in the Euro, in the eurozone, not only do they have a common currency, they have a common trade policy. So the euro, when it speaks in the international trading markets, it speaks with one voice, and that again is another area of integration that I think is very much worth worth looking at in terms of trying to 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 create the the, the benefits of a much larger market. I do think the common currency, although I hope Hippolyte's right that. Necessity will, will push it to move more quickly than many of us can imagine. I do still think it's a long road. That being said, you know, today, African countries borrow for their infrastructure largely, including from the World Bank, largely in the U.S. dollar, while they have large sums of institutional money sitting in their country in local currency. Um, you could absolutely create mechanisms to tap that those pools of capital in their pension funds, in their insurance companies, to finance the infrastructure they need and take away this huge currency mismatch that is a real a real um, obstacle to, to their development and their growth. And there's steps like that that can wean Africa off the dependence on uh, foreign currencies and over time set the table for, for a, a more integrated economic situation. The International Monetary System was set up to facilitate international trade. Institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, or to maintain stability and prevent economic crises. But critics say it was designed by wealthy nations to benefit themselves and at a cost to developing nations. Those costs are continually paid in a myriad of ways. 
from currency depreciations to inflation, high borrowing rates, low liquidity, harsher credit ratings, and more. The dollar is not the first reserve currency, and it's unlikely to be the last. Almost 500 years ago, Portugal's currency was dominant, but it was fading out, and Spain's currency was rising. 100 years later, it was the Dutch, and then the French, then the British. What do all these have in common? Each were once great empires, and each have fainted since. So are these rumblings about the dollar limited to trade issues, or is it a harbinger of bigger issues to come? John, do you see this as a sign of waning U.S. influence? A lot of countries, obviously, in the immediate term, really chafe under that burden that, in fact, they can be sanctioned in ways that only the U.S. can sanction because of its power over the U.S. currency. So the geopolitical power that the U.S. gets from having the, the reserve cur currency is something that many countries, particularly larger countries, really do find to be a burden that they want to free themselves from. And so there is internationally push to find a way out from under that burden. And that's, you know, to some extent, a good thing to the extent it frees countries from the currency risk, which is not a risk we as the United States want to impose on them. It just happens to be a consequence of having the reserve currency. On the other hand, to the extent it allows rogue regimes to obey consequences for their actions, that's maybe not such. I think when you look at uh, the geopolitics, of I mean, Obama, Treasury Secretary General, put it right, he said, the more we condition the use of dollars on adherence to U.S. foreign policy, the more the risk of migration toward the currency would increase in the medium term. I think that's where we are. It's, it's essentially one of the consequences of what has actually happened. And it became clear to the world that nobody is immune from confiscation risk. And that's what we see. If we can do that for a large economy, the nuclear power economies, then what about Djibouti? But another reason why there is a push, aggressive push toward more multilateralizing reserve currency is that we do not have enough assets, investable assets around the world. That's why we, there's always that migration back to the U.S. when they tighten interest rates. And the idea is if we regionalize even much less our reserve currencies, then we have more options and then we reduce that concentration in the direction. So ultimately, we may have to think of a different system, which actually more reflective of where the world is today, both in terms of population distribution, but also in terms of shift in the growth pattern, the trading pattern. Actually, when you look at having the rupee become internationalized um, at all of these developments, is there a point, though, where there is more chaos from so many players? Was there a unifying part of having one currency, whether it's the dollar or another currency. Well, you know, uh, Carol, uh, the pound sterling had its reign, uh, I think, uh, pretty much until the Second World War. So I guess it had a 40, 50 years of uh, maybe longer. And the U.S. dollar has had a reign of about maybe now 80, 90 years. So the time has come because the, uh, not it's not just geopolitics, it's just the economic landscape is, is shifting and it's realigning even the African countries, many of them have very high growth rates. You know, the population of Africa is truly 1.4 billion people, which is what 20% of humanity. So when the economic weight shifts to this side, this part of the world, you're bound to see the impact of that in terms of currency arrangements, free trade agreements, invoicing arrangements. In the last three, four years, the yuan, the, inter the Chinese currency, has suddenly risen to be the seventh most traded international currency. So similarly, India also has an aspiration India is the third largest economy in the world, and its economic weight in global GDP is going to increase. And therefore, it stands to gain from having its currency uh, internationalized a little more. John, when you're sitting there in conversations or when you've been um, in those conversations in government, how much are people aware of how the dollar as a reserve currency is impacting others around the world? They're very aware of how it impacts others. And sometimes the United States has, in those, in, in those periods of time, um, tried to cushion that well with different different types of programs. But I think the, the bigger issue is awareness that, in fact, there will be this this diminishment, a diminishing of influence uh, of the dollar over time. We have to accept the idea that the U.S. currency will lose influence. I mean that you know, as the terms of trade shift across the globe, uh, our ability to to maintain. Uh, uh, the dominance of the dollar is going to go into wane. And what we need to do 
is prepare for that by thinking very hard about our current fiscal situation and also thinking about how we use our current position and don't abuse that if, in fact, the dollar is become, become, going to become less and less the, the reserve currency of the world. How do we manage that in a way where we don't find ourselves now subject to, to a lot of the, the, the um, challenges that other countries are in terms of our ability to issue debt, in terms of, of, of our ability to control our own monetary policy? So, Ajit, last thoughts. How do you see the, uh, the future of the rupee internationalizing? What is the time frame of all of these changes? Internationalization is not an on and off switch. It happens progressively. But fundamentally, it will be driven by increasing economic weight of the Indian economy in the, in the global GDP. And who knows, maybe in the next few years, the rupee trade will be about 3 or 4% of global trade. These currencies are going to compete, they're jostling. Uh, the, there is clear U.S. dominance right now. In fact, the U.S. dollar is the strongest it has been in the last 50 years. But the longer term trend, the writing is on the wall. In the next 20, 30 years, we will see the emergence of yuan and the rupee as a significant part of the global international currencies. So it's like when you look at a, all of this and what's happening and historically how so many currencies have sort of uh, come up and waned according to whether their empire was in charge of the world, so to speak, do you see this as a sign of waning U.S. influence? For many years, if not decades, in the 70s, we had that petrodollar agreement and when the U.S. moved towards shale oil and achieved energy independence, my fears were what we are celebrating today may come at a huge cost. The U.S. was the main import of Saudi oil. Once they no longer have that privilege as the most important client of Saudi Arabia, the question will become if that new client to Saudi Arabia happened to be China, or India, France, the question will be, why do I need the US dollars to pay you if I am the major client that you have? And here we are. That shell oil, which provided the US energy independence, opened the gate to the end of the petrodollars. Another important trend is the fact that the US was a manuf manufacturing hub. Then they had almost the monopoly of technology. But in, in that diffusion of technology that we've seen as a result of globalizations, as a result of the globalization of value chains, actually helped accelerate the process. I think today it's very difficult to one single country to impose sanction on one without really consulting, having order on board. You're realizing that Having the U.S. and the European together is not enough. You know that you're no longer powerful when people are no longer afraid of you. I think we are really on an irreversible path where new alliance would emerge as a result of major shifts in the economic scene, major shifts in the trading scene. So we have to move toward more cooperation at the global level. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you so much to my guests, Hippolyte Fofak, Chief Economist at Africson Bank, John Simon, Founding Partner at Total Impact Capital and former U.S. Ambassador to the African Union, and Ajit Ranade, Vice Chancellor at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. To our viewers in Africa, America, and around the world, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Carol Pino, host and producer of Africa USA Now. Production by Kellen Cody and Nikki Oven. Associate producers, Alessandra Sanase and Alicia Gupta. Editing by Batsy Freddy. Graphics by Blessing Katsitzira. Africa USA Now is presented by the World Trade Center, Washington, D.C. You can find us on YouTube and your favorite podcast apps. Be sure to follow us and leave a review. A special thanks to the Africa Investment Forum for their support. Africa's investment marketplace is championed by the African Development Bank and its partners to accelerate the closure of the continent's investment gaps. Our production partners are Africa Global Schaefer and Pixie Corner. For more information on Africa USA Now, visit us at africausanow.com. We hope you've enjoyed the program and that you'll continue to join us as we delve further into the intersection of Africa, 
and the United States.